U.S. President Joe Biden has welcomed Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi to the White House at the start of his state visit to the United States. Modi is being courted as an ally against China, despite concern over his government's human rights record, including the harsh treatment of religious minorities. Modi began the public part of his visit in New York with a yoga demonstration. Inhale, slide the fingertips forward, stretch the arms forward, let the back... It's a up. yoga class, but not as you know it. Smile. Crowds took part in a celebration yeah. of World Yoga Day at the United yeah. Nations in New York. And we'll go to the floor. With one notable participant, Indian Prime Inhale, Minister Narendra Modi. Put your hands behind your back. The leader of the world's most populous country is on a visit to the United States to meet President Joe Biden. The pair are not viewed as natural allies, but leaders with a common cause. I think the thing that continues to bring them together is uh, both of us have uh, a shared concern about some of the dangerous elements of the rise of China. After concluding his time in New York, Modi traveled to Washington, where he met President Biden ahead of a state dinner at the White House on Thursday night. It's an honor Modi's critics say isn't deserved, citing India's treatment of non-Hindu citizens under Modi's premiership. And for some analysis, let's talk to Stuti Banerjee. She is a senior analyst at the Indian Council of World Affairs in Delhi. Welcome to the program, and thank you so much for joining us. With the U.S. wooing India on Modi's visit, are we witnessing the birth of a new strategic alliance here? Um, like, first of all, I would like to say the views that I'm expressing are my own personal and not of the council. And in terms of the relationship, uh, India does not look at the U.S. as an ally. We are in a partnership with the uh, United States. And the difference is that this is a partnership of equals. As um, to we have shared concerns, we have shared issues that we want to look at. So it is these shared concerns and interests which are bringing the two nations together. And yes, we are. This visit is being looked at within India, not just in the policy circles, but by people on the street, as you know, heralding the next step in the strategic partnership. So we are looking forward to where this visit is going to set the bar for the next ten years or so of the relationship. And how important do you think the partnership is with India for President Biden, for example, for the United States? I think it's a mutual uh, relationship. It is important for the United States because it finds a very important partner in the Indo-Pacific area. It finds a very important partner which shares concerns. And it's not just strategic concerns. We have issues in commonality in terms of our economic development. There is this entire stress that India has laid on peaceful neighborhood, peaceful prosperity for all. And I think that is what is important for the United States as well. And for the U.S., the relationship is also a way to engage with the region uh, through a partner which is very trusted in the region. So there is that extra push that uh, the U.S. feels that a relationship with India is going to give uh, in terms of stabilizing and bringing peace and prosperity here. There is criticism of Modi's government, for example, its ambivalence um, on uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine or its treatment of Indian Muslims as just two examples there. To what extent do you see um, the U.S. having the ability to, to pressure the Modi government on those issues? I think uh, our position uh, on the Ukraine conflict has been very well articulated by our external affairs minister, by our prime minister. We have stated what our interests are. And we've also uh, time and again stated that we would want peace and diplomacy to prevail. So India is willing to um, do whatever it can within its capacities to push for peace and diplomacy in the conflict. Um, so I don't really but I'm talking uh, about, like, for example, you know, ec economic interests. Um, you know, for example, the the purchase of energy from Russia. Do you expect, you know, that the United States might might be able to pressure India on that? I think, um, like I said, the U.S. is well aware of India's position. Uh, what the two leaders speak about in terms of uh, their bilateral dollar, we will get to know after they release a statement. But I don't think India, the U.S. now is um, 
like the U.S. understands that there are concerns that India has, there are interests that India has, and there is an understanding on that. Well, thank you so much um, for, for that view, for that perspective. Stuti Banerjee of the Indian Council of World Affairs. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Many U.S. lawmakers will be weighing Modi's words very carefully, asking themselves, is Modi's India proud of its neutrality, an ally that the U.S. can really count on? One leads the most powerful democracy in the world. The other leads the largest. While Narendra Modi and Joe Biden don't agree on everything, like Russia's war in Ukraine, they do have a common problem. India is actually the only country that's actually had military confrontations with China in recent decades. In 2020, more than a dozen Indian soldiers were killed in clashes with Chinese forces at a disputed border. Analysts expect the White House to lock India down as a regional counterweight to China. The fact that China presents a threat that we need to collaborate on, I think that brings the two leaders together more than anything between the different operating styles or political bases. While the two have met many times, Modi is just the third leader to be given the red carpet treatment by Biden, and the hospitality is due to be followed up with deals. This is a case where I think you really are going to see the, uh, the substance, the deliverables, reflect and match all of the pomp and circumstance and symbolism of a quarter to a state visit. Um, you know, you're going to see you know, dozens of agreements in areas ranging from defense to space, IT, higher education. Free speech activists, however, say Modi has overseen a backsliding of democracy in India and they want Biden to call it out. But what we want to say is that uh, any views of collaborations on trade, defense or security should not sideline the discussions on human rights and press freedom. It should be part of the conversations instead. Observers say any constructive criticism will be delivered privately. There is no getting away from it. Um, it will be discussed, but as the Americans prefer to do it, they prefer to do it behind doors with countries they have a strong partnership with. Last time Modi went to the US, he received a rock star reception. Trump was host then. But this time, it will be Biden who will hope that the optics endear him to the Indian-American community. With around four million of them, they could prove vital in elections next year. And joining me here at the big table now is Shumit Ganguly, professor of political science at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. Professor, it's good to have you right here on the day. The U.S. is pulling out all the stops for... Mr. Modi, why is it, why is this visit, why is it so important to America? I think the visit is vitally important for the Biden administration and for America because they see uh, Mr. Modi and India as a potential strategic bulwark against an expansionist and aggressive China uh -huh. in Asia and beyond. Modi... I know he's been praised at home for insisting on neutrality when it comes to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I mean, we know Washington does not like this at all. I'm wondering, will Mr. Modi, will he tell the U.S. Congress tomorrow that cheap oil from Russia may not have been worth it after all? No, I sincerely doubt that he'll... Uh, fess up to that mm -hmm. uh, before the Congress. Instead, he will talk about shared values, he'll talk about democracy, he'll talk about a, sort of a growing uh, a relationship with the United States and how the US and India are bound together on a variety of issues and the like. Mm -hmm. He's going to simply gloss over this rather contentious matter. Are, are you expecting anything from his speech to the U.S. Congress to, to make headlines? Is he going to change anything? I'd really doubt it. Mm -hmm. That's not in his character. And knowing the, his principal advisors, I doubt that he will make any uh, such dramatic shift 
uh, while addressing the US Congress. You co-authored an article in Foreign Affairs, which was published this week, entitled The Folly of India's Neutrality. Um, and in it, you write, US officials, they seem to be waking up to the promises and the limits of a strong relationship with India. It is unclear where the same can be said for Indian leaders. What New Delhi urgently needs to realize is that there is a narrow window to secure American support. All right, there's a couple of things to unpack there. Explain why is India not this cheerleader for ties with the U.S. that you say it maybe should be? And second, this narrow window, how long does India have to act before it's too late? Let me answer your question okay. sequentially. Um, the principal reason that the Indians are hesitant about forthrightly throwing in their lot with the United States has to do with the legacies of the Cold War. The shadows of the Cold War still loom very large over New Delhi, largely because of the American uh, relationship with Pakistan, which goes back as early as 1954. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And um, uh, consequently, uh, the, uh, the Indians still have doubts about the reliability of the United States, mm -hmm. even though we are in a vastly different right. era than we were during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And um, why uh, and why do I think that there's a limited window mm -hmm. for the principal reason that the U U.S. patience will not be infinite. The U.S. has been remarkably patient with India to step up to the plate and has made major concessions to India, going back to the U.S.-India Civilian Nuclear Agreement of 2008, which enabled India uh, to join normal nuclear commerce mm -hmm. without uh, acceding to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Mm -hmm. The Bush administration expended considerable political capital to make that happen. That was 2008. We're in 2023. Yeah. It's time for India to come to the realization that America will simply turn to other countries. It will turn to other countries and, of course, will be turning everything it can to contain China. Is that not present among the elites in Delhi that um, China is is the enemy, if you will? Oh, it's completely clear uh, uh, to, the, uh, to a significant segment of the Indian elite. Mm -hmm. However, uh, at the same time, they are so petrified by China, they're practically frozen in place. They fear that an explicit... A strategic partnership and a robust, viable strategic partnership, which is out in the open, will actually provoke the Chinese further. And they are unsure that, faced with that uh, provocation, how the Chinese will react. And more importantly, will the US then promptly come to India's well, assistance? Well, well, who do they have then to turn to? Uh, the, Russia is, is certainly not an ally. Russia is now in the pocket of Xi Jinping. The European Union is an ally, but it does not have the, the power um, to offer a security shield the way the United States. I mean, the U.S. really is the only game in town, isn't it, for India? That is precisely my argument, uh, which I have made in the Foreign Affairs article and elsewhere, that U.S. is the only game in town. Mm -hmm. And all this talk about American decline, well, you know, there's a sense of deja vu about it. Yeah. I've heard this before. And the US is going to remain the dominant power on, in the globe for the foreseeable future. And if anyone has the strategic reach to protect India, it's the United States. The, I know that the Biden administration is disappointed with India because it, has, it didn't vote, for example, at the UN Security Council resolutions against the invasion of Ukraine, I mean, it, the General Assembly resolution, yeah. they wanted to see the solidarity and they didn't get it from India. If India follows the path that you're advocating, can you foresee one day India standing with the United States if China invades Taiwan? This is a 
particularly interesting and vexed question. And this will be the acid test for the Indians, an acid diplomatic test that when the, one of the U.S.'s most vital interests is at risk. Mm -hmm. Can India then at least offer diplomatic support? Mm -hmm. uh, and if it fails to do so, I'm afraid that India is going to lose a enormous constituency in the United States, particularly in the U.S. Congress. Professor Shumit Ganguly, we appreciate you taking the time to come in and talk with us. We were glad that you were in Berlin and that this article was published at the same time, uh, we definitely benefited from this good co coincidence. Thank you. Thank you very much.